So here's our plan for the year. We thought, how can we maximize our impact? Let's pray for one country a month. So this month, Greece is our country. So maybe you're a parent and one of your kids has come and brought back one of these coloring sheets where they colored the flag. Uh, so we've engaged children's ministry in small groups. We sent these, so hopefully you've been praying in small groups. Uh, also, I had the chance to speak to the World Golf Village youth and the Wildwood youth to tell them what's going on around the world through church planting. So we've been praying for Greece all month. So wanted to do that now. We have amazing partnerships. And in Athens this year, we'll start our seventh new church plant in the Athens area, which is amazing. So praise God for that. So this is my friend Yotis and his wife Nopi. They have three uh, grown sons, and they pastor the first evangelical church. Yikes, sorry about that. You just tell me what you want me to do. Um, we're gonna... Game time decision. Got to be flexible, right? Um, so they lead a local church, and God has given them a vision to uh, really reach the entire Athens area. So they mentor and disciple pastors so that they can plant more and more churches. So uh, we asked them specifically what they wanted us to pray for, and these are the requests. So we're going to pray for them right now. Let's do it. Lord, we lift up our brother Yodas to you and his wife Nopi. I pray for their local church as he preaches and makes disciples there, that you'd give them much fruit. Uh, help them as they uh, mentor these other church planters. Think of uh, Jason and Eric and Tim and Alex and Stephanos, uh, these, these church planters who have a heart for you. Uh, bless their ministry this year. Pray for the families of the church planters, for their wives and children. Pray for cooperation among the evangelicals in Greece. Pray for great unity. Pray for balance between pastoring the local church and leading this ministry. Pray for the ex expanding the ministry beyond Athens and for the Athens Church Planting Hub. God, uh, thank you for this partnership. Pray that it would continue to flourish and grow uh, for your glory. We pray for the country of Greece today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We have a purpose as a church of what we're trying to aim at, everything we do. So our purpose statement, we say it each week. So please join me in saying this, to make disciples together. All right, to make disciples together. So I want to share a little bit about my journey. When I first showed up in St. Augustine, uh, was 2005. I had grown up here, but then moved back. Here's my wife, Kanan. We had two small sons at the time. They're not so small anymore. Um, and then after that, God blessed us with three daughters born here in St. Augustine, Galilee, Georgia, and Geneva, three G geography names, just in case you're wondering. Um, and then these kids keep growing. I don't know if you've noticed that with your kids, but uh, my sons are now taller than me. So this is us serving Operation Christmas Child. My sons are taller than me, and my 13-year-old daughter is almost taller than me. So, so that's our family. We're very blessed. Uh, we moved back, you know, here to St. Augustine in 05, and uh, we're looking for a church home. Visited Good News Church one time, and this quickly became our home. So thank you for so many of you who have helped raise my kids and been examples of what the gospel means in everyday life. So this is our church home. Very proud of uh, Good News Church and the impact it's making locally and around the globe, and this is our family. So just wanted to give you a quick... Little, this is game day, Friday, getting ready for St. Augustine High football game, go Jackets. So it's become a tradition for us, which is fun. So that's a little bit about my family. I believe making disciples starts in the home, and so that's a big, a big job for we as parents to figure out how to do that. And thankfully, we have a, a church home to, to do that in. So the title of the message today is No Excuses. Some of you may be familiar with the NF rap song with the same title. Uh, my teenage boys have been introducing me to... Christian rap music lately. It's not my first choice, but getting to know it a little bit. So no excuses. Today we're, gonna, we're jumping into chapter four of a story that has a lot of things that have happened already, and there's several things that are going to happen, and we're going to find that there's a reluctant leader that God chooses to use to accomplish his purposes. So here's the main point for today. God will accomplish his plan despite sinful man. You like how that rhymes there for the teachers out there? It helps stick in the brain. God will accomplish his plan despite sinful man. And what we're going to see is this is the story of Exodus. This is the story of the Bible. This is the story for us today. 
God has a plan and a purpose, and he will accomplish it in spite of us. So that's the main point for today. Um, I'm going to have a nerd out moment for, for a sec. Here's an outline. I like outlines. We're jumping in the, into a story, and so this helps me understand what's happened so far and where are we going in the story. So in chapter 1 of Exodus, we have this population explosion. You have a small group of people that now is 2 million people. It's a lot of people. So a population explosion, and then there's oppression. There's a pharaoh who wants to control this population. And so he decides, if you have a boy, you have to murder your child. Crazy plan, right? But he wants to control the population. So there's this guy, Moses, who's born. He's supposed to be murdered, but instead, God saves him through his mother, sending him in this basket down the river. And guess who finds him? Pharaoh's daughter. So it's interesting, Pharaoh's daughter, she was supposed to obey the Pharaoh too, but she chooses to take Moses in. So this Moses character, he's the key to this whole Exodus story. He is saved and redeemed, and he grows up in royalty in Pharaoh's household. So the next thing you know, uh, in chapter 2, he's, he's an adult, and he sees this Hebrew fighting with this Egyptian. He steps in and murders the Egyptian. Word gets out. Moses freaks out a little bit. He says, I got to get out of here. I don't want to get in trouble. So he flees to Midian. And so this is all in chapter 2. He, he flees to Midian. He's there as a shepherd for 40 years. So he goes from being royalty to being a lowly shepherd. Uh, Jethro, his father-in-law, he, he gives him his daughter, Zipporah, to be his wife. So he gets married, and he has a son. This is all happening in chapter 2. Then in chapter 3, you have, we've covered this the past two weeks. You have the burning bush experience where Moses gets to talk with God, pretty amazing. And then the mission is explained. Hey, Moses, I have a special job for you to do. You're going to be my spokesperson. And then what we covered last week, God gives his name. I'm the great I am, an amazing passage. So that kind of catches up to chapter 3. Then we're going to be in 4 today, and we're moving towards this confrontation with Pharaoh. And then when they actually get to depart and leave Egypt. So that's a little catch up of where we've been, we're in four today, and where we're going. So hopefully that would be helpful for you. It was for me. A lot going on in the Exodus story. But remember, God will accomplish his plan in spite of sinful man. And we see that even in the first couple chapters. And now we're in chapter four. So here's what we're going to do today. I'm going to read the Bible and make a couple comments. So pretty simple. God has something to say to you. And so we're going to jump right in and enjoy hearing from God. So if you have your Bibles, you can open up to Exodus chapter 4, or you can follow along on the screen. Exodus 4, verse 1. Then Moses answered and said, What if they will not believe me or listen to what I say? For they may say, the Lord has not appeared to you. All right, we're going to stop there for a moment. I'm not going to do this with every verse. Don't worry. Moses says, hey, he kind of comes up with an excuse, right? What, he comes up with a hypothetical situation. What if they won't listen? What if they won't believe me? And this is interesting because when you look at the context, uh, this is actually the third question he asked God. And so I want to back up a little bit to chapter 3 and point out a couple verses to show you the first two things he says. In verse 11... Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt? So God gives him a job, and he, the reluctant leader says, hey, who am I? I? I don't think I have what it takes. So that's the first pushback, the first question to God. And the second is in verse 13. Then Moses said to God, behold, I am going to the sons of Israel, and I shall say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? So he's pushing back again. I, I have this message, but what if they push back? What if they say, what's his name? What am I to tell them? So you're starting to get a glimpse into the heart of Moses, the reluctant leader. And then in verse four, chapter 4, verse 1, what if they won't believe? What if they won't listen? So there's five total things. These are the first three. And it's kind of interesting because God's so gracious throughout this whole story. He wants to instill confidence in Moses. So verses 2 through 9 are a great text where God sort of comes alongside him and says, hey, let me instill confidence in you so that the people may, be, may believe your message. So let's read chapter 4, verses 2 through 9. And the Lord said to him, 
what is that in your hand? And he said, a staff. Then he said, throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from it. But the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand and grasp it by its tail. So he stretched out his hand and caught it, and it became a staff in his hand, that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. And the Lord furthermore said to him, now put your hand into your bosom. So he put his hand into his bosom, and when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. Then he said, put your hand into your bosom again. So he put his hand into his bosom again, and when he took it out of his bosom, behold, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. And it came about that if they will not believe you or heed the witness of the first sign, they may believe the witness of the last sign. But it shall be if they will not believe even these two signs or heed what you say, then you shall take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground. And the water which you take from the Nile will become blood on dry ground. Okay, so God says, okay, I'm going to give you three miracles. The first, you have this staff. Throw it on the ground. It becomes a snake. How many people like snakes here? Is there anybody? There's a few of you guys. I'll pray for you. I'm not one that loves snakes. I run away from them, kind of like Moses. That's so great, that verse. He fled from it. That's, that's me. I can relate to Moses there. My sons, they'll go chase them and pick them up and, hey, more power to you. It's not me. But, but here we have God saying, hey, I have these miracles that I want you to perform in front of the people, the elders of Israel, so they'll believe the message. So the first is the staff with the snake. The second, imagine putting your hand in your shirt, take it out, and it's now leprous. You have leprosy on your hand. That'd be kind of weird. Then you put it back in, and then you're healed. That's the second sign. And the third, you go in your backyard, you know, you take a dip out of your pool, you pour it on the ground, it becomes blood. That would be pretty wild. And so these are the three miracles that God's saying, hey, I have your back, Moses. Perform these for the people, and they'll believe. So what is Moses' response to this, uh, these signs that God gives him? Let's look at verse 10. Then Moses said to the Lord, Please, Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither recently nor in time past, nor since thou hast spoken to thy servant, for I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. The pushback of Moses. He says, hey, this is the fourth one. I can't speak. You're asking me to speak, and I get tongue-tied. I'm not a great communicator. I'm not a good public speaker. I'm not the guy for the job. You need to find someone else. See, once again, you see the attitude of this reluctant leader, Moses, pushing back on the clear call of God. And so what's God's response here? Let's continue reading. And the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Or who makes him dumb or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now then go, and I, even I, will be with your mouth. And teach you what you are to say. But he said, please, Lord, now send the message by whomever thou wilt. So God is so gracious. He says, hey, Moses, let me remind you. I invented the mouth. I created it. I am very capable of understanding what you are able to do and not able to do. And he says, hey, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to be with your mouth. I'm going to teach you what you're to say. So God's grace And what's Moses' response? Does he drop on his knees and give glory to God and say, thanks, I'm game? He says, says, but he said, please, Lord, now send the message by whomever thou wilt. The fifth time, choose someone else. I'm not your guy. I, I can't accomplish this mission, your plan that you have for me. It's pretty interesting. You know, sometimes we have an unhealthy view of our uh, Bible heroes. (laughs) And Moses goes on to do amazing things. I'm not trying to knock the guy, but... This is the start. God's calling him on this mission, and he is very, very reluctant. How does that make you feel inside? Does that give you confidence or make you frustrated? I'm very encouraged by Moses because I don't have it all figured out, and sometimes I'm guilty of looking in the mirror and saying, God, I don't don't know if I can do that. I feel like you're calling me to do this, but I, I might not have the guts to do it. Yet Moses... His heart is revealed in this. And so we can have confidence that although Moses is trying to get out of the mission, sometimes we're trying to get out of the mission, God will accomplish his plan. We can have great confidence in that. God will accomplish his plan in spite of sinful man. 
And isn't it interesting as we look through the Bible and in the mirror, God usually uses the weak and ungifted, doesn't he, to accomplish his purposes? I don't know if that's encouraging for you, but hey, you don't have to be an all-star. You don't have to be the best player on the team. You don't have to be super gifted. God has a plan and purpose, and he wants to use you. He chooses to use us, his broken, sinful humanity, to accomplish his purposes. So be encouraged by that uh, today. The story continues in verse 14. Then the anger of the Lord burned against Moses. And he said, Is there not your brother Aaron, the Levite? I know that he speaks fluently. And moreover, behold, he is coming out to meet you. And when he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. And you are to speak to him and put the words in his mouth. And I, even I, will be with your mouth and his mouth. And I will teach you what you are to do. Moreover, he shall speak for you to the people. And it shall come about that he shall be as a mouth for you. And you shall be as a God to him. And you shall take in your hand this staff with which you shall perform the signs. Okay, so God isn't swayed by Moses' lack of faith. He says, hey, I'm going to give you an opportunity to do ministry alongside someone else. Here's your brother, Aaron. He's, in fact, a great speaker. So I love the community aspect of accomplishing God's plan. And God, in spite of Moses' attitude, says, hey, I'm going to bring your brother, Aaron. Aaron's the ultimate assist man. He doesn't need any of the glory. He kind of never gets mentioned that often. Yet he's the guy who steps in and actually verbalizes the plan to the people and to Pharaoh, which is pretty amazing. a team approach to accomplishing God's plan. Then there's some housekeeping things that need to happen. That's in verse 18 and following. Then Moses departed and returned to Jethro, his father-in-law, which was also his boss, and said to him, please let me go that I may return to my brothers who are in Egypt and see if they are still alive. And Jethro said to Moses, go in peace. Now the Lord said to Moses in Midian, Go back to Egypt, for all the men who are seeking your life are dead. So Moses took his wife and his sons and mounted them on a donkey, and he returned to the land of Egypt. Moses also took the staff of God in his hand. So this is pretty interesting. I mean, it's a pretty big deal. He has to move. He has to move with his family. He's giving up his job. Um, And so, you know, despite his hard attitude, you see some steps of obedience. It's important to note Moses is making a plan to to follow God. This next section is pretty interesting. Uh, There's a couple things I want to point out, verses 21 and following. And the Lord said to Moses, When you go back to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders which I have put in your power. But I will harden his heart, so he will not let the people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So I said to you, let my son go that he may serve me, but you, ha- but you have refused to let him go. Behold, I will kill your son, your firstborn. Sometimes there's difficult passages in the Bible that you have to pause and it's okay to acknowledge that and to ask God to give clarity. Sometimes when there's statements where God says, I will harden his heart, it might cause you to pause and think, that's weird. Why would God harden his heart? It doesn't make sense. So anytime we come across difficult passages, the first thing I like to do is start with what you know. You know, we sang about the sovereignty of God, this idea that God's in complete control of everything that happens, past, present, and future. And we can bank on that as believers. Hey, God's in complete control, even if it doesn't make sense, even if I can't have it all figured out. And so God clearly says here, I will harden Pharaoh's heart. So another thing we can do is look at context. And something fascinating as I was studying chapters 4 through 14, this idea of hardening the heart actually is brought up 20 different times. 20 times in that short span, I will harden the heart. 10 times it says that God will harden Pharaoh's heart. And 10 times it says that Pharaoh will harden his own heart. So that's interesting, right? Um, One thing I like is black and white. (laughs) I like to have things all figured out in a nice little box. Uh, Sometimes the Bible doesn't work that way. Sometimes that's not how God is. And so when I went to seminary years ago, one of the main things I came out of seminary with was sometimes God works with either or or both and. So was it Pharaoh who hardened his heart or God who hardened his heart? 
Yes. <laughs> the answer is yes. It's both and. It's not either or. And so another example of that is we think of the nature of God. He is a God of love, and he's a God of wrath. He's both. It's not one or the other. It's both at the same time. And so I want us to think about that as we think about this difficult passage of God hardening Pharaoh's heart, that there's a greater story happening, and Pharaoh still has personal responsibility for the hardening of his own heart, yet God has a perfect plan that he's going to accomplish in spite of sinful man, our main point today. So that's a difficult passage, but it, we were able to shed light on it as we think about the sovereignty of God and the context of the Exodus story. So pretty fascinating how it talks about a son and the firstborn. In ancient Egyptian culture, they had probably an unhealthy view of the firstborn. It was, uh, the firstborn was sacred and special, according to the ancient Egyptians. And so God's sort of playing into that, and he calls Israel his son. This is the first time in the Bible that God refers to someone as his son, and he's referring to Israel, his people. That's a very intimate relationship, the father-son. So he don't want you to miss that. He calls Israel his firstborn. And so he's telling Moses to tell the people, let my son, Israel, go that he may serve me, but you have refused to let him go. Behold, I will kill your son, your firstborn. So here we have foreshadowing of what's going to happen later in chapter 11, the plague of Pharaoh's firstborn son being killed. And that's actually what was the final straw for Pharaoh to let the people go after all the other plagues. So it's pretty neat. Don't miss this uh, relationship that the Lord and what he's calling his people, this sonship. Okay, this next section. I'm going to preface this by saying this is so weird. I would never choose this to preach on, but it's in the text, so we're going to read it, we're going to talk about it, and it's actually beautiful what we find here, but it's weird. So there, you've been warned. It's verses 24 through 26. Now it came about at the lodging place on the way that the Lord met him and sought to put him to death. Then Zipporah took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin and threw it at Moses' feet. And she said, you were indeed a bridegroom of blood to me. So he let him alone. At that time, she said, you are a bridegroom of blood because of the circumcision. Okay, I warned you. It's, it's weird. This has never happened to me. I hope it never does. It's very odd and strange. So why was circumcision such a big deal in the, in the Old Testament? This was God's covenant sign. This was a very big deal. So Moses and Zipporah had Moses circumcised his son. He had not. He had failed to lead his home and lead his family by executing the covenant sign that God commanded his people. So God wasn't very happy with that. The Lord met him and sought to put him to death. That's a big deal when God wants to put you to death. But then something happens. It's kind of weird, but what happens? Zipporah, the wife... She steps in, she completes the covenant sign that Moses didn't do. There's bloodshed, circumcision is intimate, it's bloody. And then what happens as a result of that? Verse 26, so he, God, let him, Moses, alone. So God wants to execute his wrath on Moses and kill him. Blood is shed, and then... God gives grace to Moses. That's interesting, right? Sounds a lot like the gospel. You see, the bad news is we deserve death just like Moses. We all fall short of God's glory. We can't save ourselves. Yet the ultimate blood was shed. Jesus Christ, his life, death, and resurrection. His blood was shed to wash us clean. And that's a problem all of us have. We all have the sin problem, yet the good news of the gospel, we all have access to Jesus. And his blood can cover us and set us free so that God will leave us alone in the sense of not give us what we deserve and killing us and giving us eternal death, but yet we have eternal life. The gospel in some obscure passage in Exodus 4, how good is that? It's amazing. Something we'd probably just read over and not think much about, but wow, God is so good. I challenge you today, think about the gospel as it relates to your life. Have you ever transferred your trust from yourself to Jesus? 
It's the best decision you could ever make. Please do that today. If you haven't, submit to the plan and purpose of God. He can wash away your sin and make you new and give you eternal life. It's the greatest decision you'll ever make. If you'd make that decision today, write it on your card. Talk to me afterwards. Tell a friend. It's so vital to respond to the gospel. And thankfully for Moses, Zipporah stepped in and Moses was spared. And God's plan continues. All right, we have one more section of scripture. You guys are doing great. Hang in there. Chapter 27 and following. Now the Lord said to Aaron, go to meet Moses in the wilderness. So he went and met him at the mountain of God and he kissed him. And Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord with which he had sent him and all the signs that he had commanded him to do. Then Moses and Aaron went and assembled all the elders of the sons of Israel. And Aaron spoke all the words which the Lord had spoken to Moses. He then performed the signs in the sight of the people. So the people believed, and when they heard that the Lord was concerned about the sons of Israel and that he had seen their affliction, then they bowed low and worshiped. So we see God's plan unfolding. Despite Moses and his excuses, Aaron comes along. The plan is, is happening. They go to the elders of Israel. They gather them. And who's the spokesperson? Moses. God tells Moses. Moses tells Aaron. Aaron delivers the message. Moses performs the signs. Remember the three miracles? And it's a beautiful thing. The plan is starting to take hold. So why did Moses say no to God? Why did he make excuses? Probably the same reasons we do, right? You know, we look at the mirror and we think, ah, I just, I don't, I might not have what it takes. I was meeting with Dave Ackerman this week and he talked about the terrible twos. Not T-W-O, but T-O-O. I'm too old. Maybe the ship has sailed. Maybe I don't have what it takes to contribute any longer. Maybe I'm too young, students. I'm just a student. I mean, come on. Does God really require anything of me? I'm too eloquent. Maybe we have too high of a view of ourselves, and we think we're too good, and we get in the way. Uh, Too tongue-tied, like Moses. I'm just not a good speaker. I just don't want to break the silence barrier. I can't talk that well. Too busy. The American mantra, right? I'm, I'm too busy. I don't have time to, to you know, partner with God in his plan. Too broke. I don't, I'm worried about money all the time. So there's so many excuses we make. So we are like Moses. We look in the mirror instead of looking to the Father to find our confidence and ability to accomplish his plan. So listen to this. Our excuses will not hinder the plan of God. God's plan will be accomplished. Our excuses will not hinder the plan of God, but listen to this. They will hinder our joy and our fruitfulness for God's kingdom. Our excuses and getting in the way and looking at ourselves will certainly hinder our joy and our fruitfulness for God's kingdom. It's important to remember that. So what was God's plan? What was his plan for the people in Exodus? His plan was to redeem, to rescue, to save, to set free. And this same God that was trying to do that then, guess what? He's still, it's the same God. He's doing that today. He seeks to save, seek and save the lost, to redeem, to make a way of a hopeless situation. Isn't that great? And he wants to include us. How fascinating is that? So I want you to notice this last verse of this chapter. Uh, I have the luxury, because I don't preach weekly, I've had the chance to sit in this chapter for several weeks. And God has really just brought this uh, verse to light. And I was able to share it with a buddy this week who called me, and his life is falling apart because of his own doing, because of his sinful decisions. And I was able to share this verse with him to encourage him, and I hope it'll be encouraging to you as well. So the people believed, and when they heard that the Lord was concerned about the sons of Israel and that he had seen their affliction, then they bowed low and worshiped. So the Israelites get a bad rap, and you'll see as the story unfolds, uh, they are certainly sinful people like you and I. But what's their first response? As they hear Moses and Aaron, as they see the signs, what does it say they did? They believed. They exercised faith. They believed that this God, this covenant-keeping God, was for them and that he heard them and knew where they were at. And I love this. 
They heard that the Lord was concerned about them and that he had seen their affliction. I know many of you are in a tough spot. I don't know how specifically, but you need to know that God sees you. He knows exactly where you're at. He sees your affliction, and he's present. Let's not miss this. The same God that was called these Israelites their son, their firstborn, it's the same God that we serve today that hears us, he sees us, he knows us, and somehow, some way, we're going to get through it. Maybe not in this life, maybe it's the life to come, but we have confidence in the God that we serve that he sees us in our wherever we're at. Amen. Isn't that great news? So the people believed, and what else did they do? They worshiped. They worshiped. And aren't you glad that today... We're here to worship, but our worship is not limited to one hour on a Sunday morning. If it was, that'd be pretty bad news for God who wants worship in everything we do, right? And so how do we worship? Students, we worship as we do school, as we interact with our friends, how we speak to and talk to our teachers. We can worship as a business owner, how you treat your employees, as an employee showing up tomorrow morning at work, worship. In your hobbies, what you do for fun can be an act of worship. God has a plan, and he'll accomplish his plan in spite of sinful man. We see that throughout Exodus. We see that throughout the Bible. So what are we to do? Believe in worship. Believe in the gospel. Believe in this covenant-keeping God that we serve. And let our lives be acts of worship to him. Let's pray. Father, Son, and Spirit, we do worship you. Help us to believe. Help our unbelief. We desire today to, to hear from you, to be met by you, to, that our lives would count for your glory, not our own, but for your glory. God, I pray that you would make your word, the seeds of your word, grow in our hearts today, that we would worship you in spirit and in truth, every moment of our lives, that we would bow low and worship. God, meet the needs of your people today. Thank you for seeing us and knowing right where we're at. So minister to us today, your people. In Jesus' name, amen.